today we're going to talk about community health. Uh, we have done quite a lot of work in uh, in uh, community and trying to promote like the extension of the HS towards the towards the community as well. And uh, and today we're going to have quite a lot of different type of presentations that expand to through different countries. And and I'm very happy to see that the community is really taking taking over as well on uh, on the extension of DHIS. So I don't think I have to explain you, but it's uh, it's why it's fundamental and what are the benefits of uh, collecting community data and integrating them in the information system, in the routine information system. You can enhance your data collection, you can target better your interventions, have real-time monitoring of your interventions and your extensions in, in the community. And of course, these means that you can allocate better your resources, you can engage better the community because you have a reason and, and a background and evidence of, of the activities that are run in the community. Um, what we have here, it's uh, it's uh, the CHRS toolkit that we have collaborated with with UNICEF. Remy is also in the room, so uh, thank you, Remy, for helping us to produce this piece of work. It's uh, it's a modular, a very flexible approach. Um, it uh, it uh, each module has like a, a list of standardized indicator, and uh, that can be reviewed, adopted, and spread across the different type of activities. Because of course, some countries might do uh, an activity that is purely related to one health program, but sometimes there are also other activities that are not specific to one health program, like for example, uh, mental health. Mental health, uh, you can't just isolate it for just one single program. It can cross cut across different type of activities. And also different countries have different ways of approaching uh, the way that they um, put into action their, their programs. So it might be that they just go there to do uh, vaccination, nutrition, and childcare, or it might be that it's just a program for TB, let's say. So that is the main reason also why it's such a flexible approach so that countries can almost like pick and choose depending on what their needs are. But at the same time, starting from a standardized base that it's coming from global guidelines. Um, the the as you see here, the actual CHS modules are, are quite big but very extensive. So you really have a, like a really strong baseline to pick and choose and start implementing in countries, or at least take inspiration from the global guidelines to start um, having the discussions or maybe integrating extra informations that before you were not considering. So you see that like we have quite a lot of modules that are already integrated with uh, with um, with data sets, with dashboards, both uh, some of them both uh, monthly or yearly, and then we're relevant either or monthly or yearly, and all of them already have a dashboard that can be uh, mapped against or at least like used as a as a source of uh, of a conversation starter, let's say, with the authorities. So um, what is also very important to continue uh, the work that is done in the community is, of course, triangulating that with the facility because uh, the community in the end is an, uh, often an extension of what is run in the facilities. So there are different processes to, to start that triangulation with data integration, data validation, comprehensive analysis, because what you have in the community then reflects also your activities in the facility. And of course, it has a range of benefits of, uh, of doing this type of triangulation because you start having a better overview of your activities that are extended also in the in the outreach work and you can also triangulate this information to improve the accuracy of your data because you can start seeing if there are like big discrepancies in type of outreach and, and volume of activities so to also understand and better um, direct your your efforts and uh, and uh, and resources of course I've been promoting this throughout. So a lot of talk about this is just like one of the many toolkits that we have. But if you guys have like more um, questions about toolkits, global toolkits in particular, in this auditor auditorium at uh, at 4 p.m., we're going to talk about like general toolkits and like uh, the, the work that our team is doing to support the standardization of, uh, of the outputs that we have out there. So as I said before, um, we have quite a range of presentations today, and that's part, like 
span throughout the continent as well. So we're going to have Vincent, who is going to talk to us about the experience of um, of the national TB and leprosy control um, team in Uganda. Then we're going to have San, uh, Professor Sanju um, from the Graduate School of Public Health, uh, and they're going to um, give us more information about the um, the type of work that they have been doing in uh, in Senegal. Caroline um, from the National AIDS Council in Zimbabwe uh, about the optimization of community HIV work uh, directly in the community, of course. Uh, Evans, who is going to give us more information about uh, the work that they've been doing in, in Zambia in, with the community. And, uh, and Mania, who is going to present uh, on behalf of the team um, in, uh, in Kenya, and is going to give us more information about how they leveraged uh, DHIS for the data collection and the analysis of data in the community. So I don't want to steal time from the presentations because they are truly the reasons why we are here. So thank you again for being here today. And uh, yes, so I'll, I'll, start, uh, I'll start off with Vincent. Thank you so much. I can control it. Can you give me a test? Hello. Yeah, it's working. It's working. So to change your slide. Yeah. Can go right and left. Right and left. Okay. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Vincent Kamara, and I am here um, from Uganda. Uh, first, I need to, to appreciate that uh, in Norway, sleeping is at your own time, because it never gets dark. So if the chickens from my home country came here, they would be really confused, because they don't know when it rises and when it goes dark. Anyway, so now we are going to talk about um, how we are fostering community awareness, screening and diagnosis for TB and leprosy uh, using DHIS2. Uh, to start with, uh, Uganda stands for a Uganda free of tuberculosis and leprosy. And at the National TB and Leprosy Control Division, we foster this through providing quality, accessible and affordable TB and leprosy services to all population groups in the country. And among them, we do policy formulation, resource mobilization, and most importantly, strategic planning, setting standards. And what we are doing here is monitoring and evaluation. So when we started in 2019, we agreed on a certain number of objectives. And these are what you see here. They are six in number. Uh, but the most important there that we bring us here is uh, objective number six that looks at building effective and efficient systems that ensure quality, equitable, and timely TB and process services. So in that case, is that's how we manage to go to the community. So like I said, in 2019, um, when we start to do the strategic plan, we know that we are among the 30 high burden TB and TBHIV countries uh, in the world. Uh, our population is around 47 million Ugandans, and uh, estimated TB cases uh, every year is 94,000. So by around um, that time when we start, we were looking at 253 per 100,000 population, people having TB. And we said, we need to reduce this uh, within five years. But then boom, 2019, COVID-19. So all the gains we had done at that time, I'll show you in the slides, started going down. So we were affected by the so we started having biggest, big numbers of people missing TB um, and everything we had uh, started to gain, started losing momentum. So in 2021, um, we said, okay, let's sit and review this. So we said, let's design something that takes us to the community because if the people are not coming to us, we need to go to them. So we, we dubbed um, a campaign, um, designed to implement a TB and case finding strategy called uh, Community Awareness, Screening, Testing, Prevention, and Treatment of TB, and we dubbed it called CAST-TB. 
And it was to accelerate the reduction of TB transmission and to find the cases that had been uh, missed and linking them back to, to treatment. Uh, for those who don't know, Uganda is that red mark eh? in the middle of a uh, continent. And this is how the design uh, of, the, um, of the cast is. So when you see the little numbers we said, first it begins from the health facility to map up where they think the TB is. And they look through their registers, for those that have registers, and uh, they see the addresses of the people who have TB. So meaning they're identifying where the TB is in, that, in, their, in their catchment population. And then uh, what they would call the hotspots. For those who have a case-based surveillance system, which is also DHIS2 based, they pick out the list of index TB patients and then identify where they're coming from and then map out there. Um, the areas that they would call hotspots. And then they link up with the village health team members who are at the health facility level and they go to the community. And we said, let them do a house to house a screening and um, a screening for TB. So they go with this, we train them to go and uh, set a number of questions and ask them so that they can identify people with, who have a presumptive TB. So we also uh, trained them and gave them the equipment so they are able to pick the samples uh, for presumptive TB cases, those who have a cough, and um, are able to send. We have hub breeders who can take that the samples to to the laboratories. Um, so they were also they were also doing contact tracing for the index TB patients when they go to the communities and able to. Um, pick the, the data at that level. So the people who come to the health facilities, they're diagnosed, and those who have TB are started on treatment. Those that do not have TB, uh, we, if they are contacts, they are given TPT. So it was a whole um, uh, community structure, which was led by the community um, leadership. So the local council chairpersons, the administrative units, the health, district health officers were all involved in the mobilization and advocacy for the community activity. First to mention that it is um, supposed to help us to identify new cases. And uh, in this, of course, we had to think of how we should be able to get the data. And that's how we ended up introducing the TB info, which is a DHIS2 reporting system that would help us in timely reporting and uh, data capture. So to integrate the TB, um, the, the, the system, of course, we looked at the existing system. We saw in step number one, at the time when we had the health facility, how do we line list the index TB patients? How do we line list the patients who are lost to follow up? How do we uh, get the patients who have uh, no documentation? Because by the time they are not coming to the health facilities, they are not able to capture information about them. So this is where it, we, it had to start. And now we picked out areas that where we're going to pick the data from either the registers or the electronic case-based surveillance system. And then now in the next level, they go to the community to, do, to, to, to start with um, a screening of contacts of TB, uh, screening community members, identifying presumptives, collecting sputum samples, and then referring them for evaluation. And then the next level is to deliver the completed data forms, uh, data collection forms uh, to the health facility. Now we are starting the linkage from the community to the health facility. And what kind of system do you able to do you use uh, to capture this information? And then once they get to the health facility, there is a level of uh, triangulation uh, between what has been captured in the community vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what is in the health facility, both registers and the system that is at um, at the health facility. And then to submit the information to, to the district for use. So you can see the last step is the district TB and leprosy supervisors, the biostatisticians and the M&E focal persons who verify the report. Uh, they compare what is in the aggregate DHIS2, which we call EHMIS, versus the tracker base, which is the electronic case based surveillance, and what has come from the community. And then they can do the intervention. Now they can know where the hotspots are, where they can continue to get more TB within the district itself. And this is what we got. See, um, I'll start from the graph. Those were the gains that we had had from 2010. The TB from our estimated, the estimation is done at WHO level, the modeling. So we know the incidence that it has been 
going up and up and up. So you can see in 2019, when we had reached 77, then we went down. So we said we can't wait for another year to continue going down. That's where we started the CAST uh, TB uh, campaign. And it got us to 82%. And in 2022, because in 2021, we did in 50 districts. And in 2022, we said, let's go to the entire country. We actually got all the 94,000 people we anticipated to have TB when we did the house-to-house -house community intervention. And we were able to actually capture the information in real time because we already had an electronic system, both the tracker and the aggregate. So, of course, that was a campaign mode. Just what I, need, I never mentioned is the campaign actually is done in four days. Four days is the actual community work when they go to the facilities, how, sorry, the, the households, house to house, to identify the TB patients. And then another one week to aggregate the data, report, clean, and others. So all that game that we see that we did in 2022, you can say it's a two weeks work of the people we had actually failed to capture in the entire year or even more. So, and we are able now to get to the different regions that contributed highest. So the bigger circle up there, there are Choli, um, Lango and Bugisu, those are the ones that gave us the biggest gains. And on the map we are able through DHIS2 dashboards, we are able to know which regions, which districts, which sub-counties are actually giving us the biggest number of TB patients through their TB info. And then those, Moving forward, uh, actually, the sub-counties that where the health facilities put more emphasis when they are going to look out for TB cases in the community. So this box, as we see, are the total households that we reached. We went to 2 million, 2.7 million households. Our VHT is reached there. And in that year, the 94,000 that uh, had been reported, we can say 12,000 came from that two-week activity, 12%, sorry, 12% 12 of those TB cases that were identified came from the community activity. And we actually got also some leprosy cases. For the first time, we actually got 581 leprosy cases in the country. We had always identified 100, 200 in a year, and we managed to get 500. So it, um, as at the national program, we actually noted that we are yet to eliminate leprosy as a public health threat in the country. So we are still there uh, trying to identify. So how has DHIS just streamlined our data collection? Our first is that first point where it says it has increased interest with improved hope for availability of community data. Today, I got a saying that uh, trust comes walking, but goes running. So for people to trust the data that you have, you have to first give them hope that actually the data is there. So when we did cast uh, data collection and actually presented, the people were able to know that the reports can actually be got from the community. And what kind of reports? When we presented the improvement, when we presented where we, we felt the TB was, where the leprosy was, then they were like, oh, then they are able to trust the data that we give them. Of course, enhanced data quality, since it enables data triangulation among electronic systems, we were able to triangulate in these different systems, much as it was not very easy. And then having a unified platform allows easy comparison and attribution, because once you have all the data in electronically, then you should know where to attribute which gain. What did we do in order to achieve this? And then, of course, improved visualization. It was so amazing when the district health officers were able to get this map for their place and see this graph for their place and say, oh, this is where the TB came from. So with this uh, visualization, they were able to know, oh, this is a really crowded place. This is a place with very poor housing. This is a place that has slums. I think it's possible that the TB is actually in that area. So they were able to attribute the gains they got from what they, they see in their communities. Uh, of course, that was the dashboard and the maps, they use them a lot, especially in there because they had a pre-entry to the activity and also the post-activity meetings to look at what uh, they had 
they had, they, they had gained in their districts. And this was also an after effect. So after we did cast, when we went for the after event, on this side, you'll see following the TV cast campaign, we actually saw drug resistant TB outbreak. We would call it like a kind of outbreak in these two areas. So there was Bumbo Trading Center where they found 23 MDR cases. And then the following one in Buremba where they got eight PBCs who were MDR cases. So through that, we also managed to do our port health where we could improve our screening uh, for TB on cross-border uh, areas. So among the challenges, quickly, the behavior change. That's why I said the trust keeps running. Telling people that we can actually get community data was very difficult, but it has helped. Summarizing the data from hard copies caused some quality issues, and then data triangulation among these systems and uh, system interoperability. Because how we thought it would change is one, I'm glad uh, Victoria talked about this, the data validation rules uh, is something that we may need to pick from what the WHO is showing us. So implementing this, and also these interactive dashboards, um, they help you to point out where the errors are, and then you can be able to correct them. And where I want to go, I'm really interested. I want to see the presentation from Kenya, the electronic uh, community health information management system. We are doing a similar thing in Uganda, and we want to bridge the two. So uh, I would be glad to see uh, what our neighbors are doing so that we can see how to exchange notes from here. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vincent. I actually, I don't know about you, but I get super excited when I hear these, these presentations. And, uh, and uh, to quote my old Ugandan supervisor, it's very true. If you don't have the data, it never happened. So that's really the reality here as well. Next, I would like to call Professor Sunju with her presentation on... Uh... <laughs> I can, I can, if you tell me next, I can be here clicking for you if you want. Can you test? Ah, yes, it's working. It's can you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Okay. You can go in your uh, packet. Packet. Mm. I don't have any packet. I will. I will. I will. Can be here. You tell me next. I can be here. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I will do. I will do okay. by myself. Just click this one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you have. Okay. okay. Uh, That's why it's like if you want, I can do it for you. Whatever you prefer. Mm, this is slide mode. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Sonju Gang, and um, I'm from South Korea. <laughs> South Korea, and uh, I'm very uh, excited to share our, our research uh, uh, result to focusing on optimizing health system in uh, rural Senegal. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> Let me briefly introduce our project uh, and motivation behind our project. Uh, with, uh, uh, after the cooperation um, agreement between Senegal government and South Korea government, uh, we implemented the seven-year project since 2017. And uh, we provided three years uh, invitation training. Each year, we invited 20 government officials uh, for, uh, specialized in MCH, maternal child health. Every year we invited 20 uh, officials and we provided uh, three, uh, three weeks uh, um, invitation training from top to uh, central government and provincial level and uh, uh, provider level. And we launched our four-year uh, strengthening uh, 
her system uh, focused on MCH, MCH uh, um, from 2018 to 2022. And, um, and at the time, uh, our uh, research team, our project team, we are very interested in understanding the change of health system um, efficiency over the, our duration of project year and preceding and following the project. That's why we <laughs> did our uh, study. And here in this uh, slide, we, uh, I just prepared three scenario. So uh, since um, my background, I'm uh, my specialized in nursing management and law, and I involved in uh, most of the official development project since 2010. And I just involved in many uh, over over um, 30 uh, project. And at the time, I just uh, interested in what kind of scenario as an implementation of project? What kind of scenario as uh, you are the government officials? So what kind of scenario you are expecting when you do some a special project? Scenario one or two or three? I think the scenario two is a more ideal model because um, the changes improved after the project year. But scenario one, uh, it has uh, some issues of feasibility study because they set the target too low. Uh, uh, to analyze the efficiency of changes in reg uh, regional health system, we have uh, three uh, specific aim aims to answer our research questions. Uh, there are a few studies uh, uh, utilizing Senegal's DHIS2, and one such uh, study was conducted by Muhoza. Muhoza is uh, uh, as his doctoral dissertation at Johns Hopkins University. Fortunately, one of my colleagues, he, he is one of uh, Muhoza's dissert doctoral dissertation committee and I just could have access to this uh, very valuable research. And these are the uh, summary of regional health information system. Uh, they are using barriers and facilities, facilities facilitators identified in Senegal. And uh, during our project, our study, we confronted the similar similar, um, uh, similar uh, situation because uh, uh, originally we uh, tried to collect data from uh, before the, our project launched from 2018, but it was very difficult to access to data because uh, Senegal, uh, their center, MOH day, because of the heavy, heavy uh, volume, they just down downloaded all the uh, 2018 or 2017 data and we couldn't access because of uh, uh, data security issues. This is our research framework. To analyze uh, efficiency, health system efficiency, we, we had to approach relative, calculate relative efficiency. So this is our model. So, uh, there are input and output variables, and we, after calculate, we uh, analyze additionally the impact of environmental factors. So DEA, have you ever heard? Of, I believe data environment analysis. Uh, this uh, this um, statistical method is mostly used in uh, uh, health economics. So um, actually our catchment area is, uh, uh, we focused on Fati and Kaolak region. In central area, there are seven, seven regions, but to uh, analyze relative efficiency, we had to delete the um, discrepancies of uh, the region. So we uh, used the UNDP HDI index instead of, because there is a lack of information of the Senegal's region, regional gross domestic product data. So we, we use the UNDP HDI and Dakar is the capital city, their HDI is too, too high. So we excluded uh, Dakar and we, uh, our in our analysis, we use uh, six regions except Dakar. And out of uh, 45 here, <clears throat> 45 uh, medical district, uh, we uh, 
so advice we got uh, advice from uh, director of health center who uh, visited invited our Korea to uh, to make the, our analysis DNA. We call the decision making unit health district in DEA analysis decision making unit more similarity the regional. So we uh, choose choose twenty one medical district out of forty five. Uh, this slide shows the demographic, demographic of uh, uh, 27 uh, DMU decision making unit of health district, uh, focusing on their number of total population and total fertilized women aged uh, 15 to 48. And uh, this this table shows the variables, input and output, and environmental variables. Uh, for the output variables, we call uh, we utilize DHIS two. But uh, in DHIS DHIS two, we couldn't get the input and environmental variables, so we collaborated directly district health department. Uh, from uh, starting from this uh, slides. The following slide show the uh, similarity of the, our variables, but I will uh, dig into detail the uh, explanation. So these are the input barriers and output barriers. So input barriers, we uh, the number of doctors, nurses, midwives, and delivery bed. And output barriers, A and C, antenatal care and scheduled birth attendant, and mm -hmm. Postnatal care and uh, vaccination related variables. And for the environmental variables, there are four distant to health facilities from to the village, from a village to health post or health center, and for a number of health facilities and what number of fertile women and number of health workers. Uh, from uh, this point on, on, onward, uh, this slide uh, table shows uh, the order, input and output, and environmental variables uh, included in our uh, efficiency analysis. And this table shows the difference between uh, two years. And in our study, we uh, just uh, approached the three. Three ways. It's a full model. In full model, we just uh, included all the input and output variables. And uh, the second contained module, we controlled the environment factors. And another final intervention model, we call ODA model, official development model. Uh, because throughout our four year process, we didn't support any vaccination activities. So we, we excluded that variable in the uh, output variables. So I will explain. In our firm model, um, the average efficiency score, efficiency scores, it uh, range from zero to one. So it means efficiency score one, it, it means that health district is efficient, efficient. So efficient district decreased from 11, the number of uh, efficient, efficient uh, health district is decreased from 11 in 29. 19 to 8 because of the pandemic, you can imagine. And the average score was 0. 0.7978 in 2019 to 7909 in 2020. And seven districts remained consistent efficient over both years. This is the, so you can, uh, you can see the efficient score. The bottom, bottom line is the it shows the mean efficiency score. So it decreased from 2019 to 2020, and it shows the rank. And we uh, analyzed, is there a um, disparity among regions? And table 10 shows the mean of efficiency score, so F region, F region is efficient. It shows efficient because the efficient score is one, but it decreased in the following year. But, and uh, we uh, 
conducted a critical analysis test to verify is there any significant difference, but it doesn't show any uh, statistically significant among regions in their efficiency. In environmental factors, we include four, four barriers, average distance from resident uh, distance and number of health facilities and and uh, we uh, use the women, the number of women of childbearing age as a standard to generalize other environment environmental factors since it affects it influences the allocation of human and resource material resources. Two minutes left. I can use more. <laughs> Two minutes. Yeah. So. Uh, so we just uh, controlled. So in our contained model, so this is the, the um, just the, for example, like efficiency score, uh, efficiency health district, the mean distance is 10, 32 kilometers. And um, so correlation, only uh, fertility women for facilities uh, strongly correlated. And we uh, analyzed Toby regression to impact only the number of fertility women and number of community health workers affect the efficiency. And in our contained model, we controlled. It means we included two more variables, number of healthcare facilities and number of Vazengo. Vazengo is a reaction person in your community health workers like between a health facility to a mother, pregnant women. But with the result, um, the efficiency score is similar between the full model and contained model. And if you use the DEA, you can uh, have a reference stat. It means uh, the the lowest efficiency. If we have our health district have a lower uh, efficiency score, which health district we have to benchmark. It shows so reference that it means the you have you should benchmark other efficient health district. And intervention model ODA model we this in contained model we excluded. Uh, vaccination related variables in our output variables. Uh, DMU 12, 14, 20, 22 with the asterisk mark is our catchment area. It shows, um, even though the pandemic, it shows the increase in efficiency score, but it doesn't statistically uh, significant because we only uh, analyze two years if we just use analyze more than four years and preceding and following years, how can we expect? What kind of result we will um, receive? I, I don't know. But uh, we, it's very difficult to get more uh, information 2021 and 2022 we couldn't uh, analyze. So this is the summary of the discussion and recommendation. <laughs> so we should, uh, because uh, why we should, uh, use this study because we want to utilize the DHIS2 data because Senegal's government, they are using the, and we don't want to broaden our partners to collect additional data for our uh, ODA project. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for having to cut you short. <laughs> but otherwise, we don't have a... We don't have time for the others. In any case, there will be some time for, for question and answer later. So please feel free to ask further questions if something is not clear. But you see also how DHIS can also provide the input data to do more statistical analysis and more in detail analysis as well of the efficiency of the system of how it has been uh, organized. Um, I'll leave it now to, to Caroline. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Can you see? Okay. Hello. Yes, I hear it. You can hear me. Okay. No, that's not the one.
Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Caroline. I'm uh, with the National AIDS Council of Zimbabwe. And today I'm going to present on how we are optimizing digital technologies to strengthen community HIV programming in Zimbabwe using DHIS2. So just a brief overview that the Zimbabwe National AIDS Council is responsible for coordinating the multi-sectoral response to HIV and AIDS in reducing new um, HIV acquisitions. Uh, and Zimbabwe is one of the countries that have uh, reached epidemic control, uh, also surpassing the 95-95-95 fast-track targets. So this really then calls uh, for us to have precision monitoring of HIV um, programs and also particularly to tailor make uh, sensitive differentiated HIV services as well as SRH uh, services. So to achieve um, this, you'd realize that in 2021, the National AIDS Council in partnership with the University of Oslo, we rolled out the DHIS2 tracker. This was not a new initiative. Uh, already the country was using DHIS2 uh, for Ministry of Health and Child Care as well as other implementing partners, but for the clinical aspect of HIV. And therefore the uh, country leveraged on these mainstay platforms to expand the utility of GHIS2 and particularly monitoring HIV and uh, community-based HIV prevention uh, programs. So in terms of um, how uh, HIV prevention is being done in Zimbabwe, we are focusing mainly on around eight HIV prevention models. Models are just basically, these are strategies that we are impl implementing um, to prevent HIV, and this, these are done at community uh, level. So you'd find that uh, the, the models or the strategies, they uh, focus mainly on key populations, adolescent girls and young women, as well as adolescent uh, young boys and men. Why? Because our evidence points to that these populations are where there is um, high, dis high HIV burden. This is where we also are finding our highest uh, new HIV infections around these populations. And um, these models at district level, uh, they're adopted right at a wide level where um, a hotspot mapping is done outside of DHIS2, of course, but using other instruments like hotspot mapping, um, evidence programming to identify where there are HIV hotspots within the districts. And each model um, has a, a peer leader who can be referred to a peer uh, mobilizer in some instances. They can be a micro planner, they can be a mentor. So the name of this peer leader just depends on the uh, program uh, set up. And then the peer leader uh, is then responsible of identifying amongst a group of other peers who are at high risk of HIV acquisition using a risk assessment. So you'd find that each program has got its own risk assessment uh, factors that determine whether a person is at high risk or at low risk, and what type of interventions uh, can be offered to them uh, depending on their risk rating. Once a person is enrolled into a model, uh, some HIV prevention sessions or lessons are then carried out. So each model has guidelines detailing what, um, the, the topics that should be discussed in terms of HIV prevention, uh, the activities that should be done in terms of HIV prevention, and um, the, the duration of the program. So for example, the sister to sister program can have 25 girls in the club uh, that are taken through the sessions uh, in a period of three years or a year. And uh, this, all these activities were being done uh, manually before we introduced DHIS2. You also realize that uh, during these sessions and these uh, lessons, the peer leader also refers 
their peers to access HIV prevention services at a public health facility or at an, uh, any facility uh, that is offering uh, services. It can also be an NGO supported uh, facility. So the, the peers, they go there, they access the services and the facility uh, gives a feedback on whether the person has received the service or not. And therefore the peer leader is able to track uh, individuals within their cohorts of uh, their final HIV uh, outcome. So with the introduction of uh, DHIS-2, we have managed to um, utilize DHIS-2 to conduct risk, ass risk assessment um, that is used to enroll uh, peers into the model. So as I've already alluded to earlier on, each um, model has got a different risk assessment factors. But with DHIS-2, we are able to compute the risk rating, uh, which was very difficult previously, but DHIS-2 is um, able to automatically compute the risk rating uh, and ascertain whether a person is at high risk so that they can be enrolled uh, into, the, into the program. And also after uh, the risk has been assessed, um, the peer is then registered into DHIS2. And it is during this registration pro process that a unique identifying code is generated. And we also adopted a, a UIC algorithm that was already being used by one of the implementing partners in Zimbabwe. And this is because we want to be able to deduplicate the people as they are going to be accessing services. So we had to really adopt a universal uh, uh, UIC across um, across uh, the program. Uh, and then, so when the person is uh, registered, they're then enrolled into the program and the sessions are conducted using DHIS2. So you would find that the different sessions uh, uh, that the person goes through, they can be going uh, through HIV, uh, STI prevention sessions, they can be going through HTS sessions, all these are just uh, sessions that they are, they are going through, and these are happening in DHIS too. So the community uh, volunteer is also able to track uh, the number of people who've managed to um, attend all the sessions. They are able to register session attendance using DHIS too. They are also able to monitor who has managed to complete uh, the full course or attending the number of required sessions that you should uh, attend for you to complete a course. We're also able to monitor how, um, how many people have dropped out or have uh, stopped uh, the, 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 the implementation and what are the reasons for their dropping out. And um, in terms of the service uh, outward referral, we also adopted the Minister of Health and Child Care uh, several um, service outward referral slip. This is a manual booklet, but we have uh, put it um, uh, in, in DHIS too. And we have also adopted it because we are looking at uh, interoperability and integrating the, our systems to have one monitoring and evaluation system. So we would really want to have something, some of the things that are in common if we are, if we are to look at integration and interoperability. So um, when the peer is then um, referred for a service, we have what we call a service back referral, where the service provider is able to complete um, and confirm whether the PA managed to receive the service or not. And this is also being done through DHIS2. So what have we achieved through using DHIS2 in Zimbabwe? We have managed to achieve a harmonized digital approach. As you can see, the picture on your right is just illustrating the number of forms that one person used to complete uh, in order um, when they're carrying out the activity. So this is particularly for the sister to sister program, which is a program uh, among young uh, adolescent girls and young women. So these are the risk assessment forms they had to complete for each individual in their cohorts. These are the forms, the session registers, as well as the reports that they had to complete manually. But with the coming in of DHIS2, we managed to compress all this into one mobile device. And, um, have all these tools uh, being managed on one mobile device. We've also managed to reduce our costs in terms of printing and reprinting. So you'd find that 
this is a very huge project where we have over 5,000 community volunteers using DHIS2. So we, and we appreciate that our monitoring and evaluation tools, they are updated uh, over time as they are reviewed. So reprinting these tools would really cost us a lot as a country. And with DHIS2, we have reduced uh, printing, printing and reprinting costs by simply updating our computerized um, tools. And also in terms of transportation costs, where the reports had to be submitted to the next level, either by post or by, tra um, by actually traveling to the next level to, to submit your report your reports and this has been uh, these costs have been re reduced significantly. We've also realized real-time reporting and performance monitoring. Uh, we, of course, we have our, uh, our records updated on, uh, in real time. We are able to utilize our dashboards for decision making and also we are able to uh, identify um, uh, our locations using the uh, DHIS2 maps. Also, we have also further advanced, uh, enhanced our communication and feedback uh, using DHIS2 community uh, platform. Uh, we've also managed to implement a help desk, a DHIS2 help desk, where issues are discussed, uh, problems uh, are also discussed that relates to DHIS2 configurations. And we have our UIO team also on that platform to quickly um, address issues that need to be identified. And then in terms of what are the major highlights, so you'd realize that the DHIS2 uh, for HIV prevention in Zimbabwe is a tracker for non-biomedical interventions, as I've already alluded to. It also ensures service layering. So we are saying, for example, if a girl is um, enrolled into the sister-to-sister -sister program and they are a sex worker, they can always be referred to a SESHA clinic, which is an organization that is providing services for sex workers, and using the UIC, they are not duplicated, but the services are, are layered to them using the UIC. DHIS2 is also offering information security through the use of the UIC and agent code for key populations, as well as um, customization of user accounts to a particular community volunteer with which is password protected and uh, no one else can access their information. Service access, I've also spoken about that, and also feedback and communication. But you'd find that what uh, we are mainly using the UIC uh, to achieve all this service layering, information security, data deduplication, de etc. In terms of decision making, we are utilizing the HIS2 dashboards to generate what uh, we are using as HIV prevention cascades in Zimbabwe. So just last week, Zimbabwe was sharing in the South to South Learning Network, uh, for those who are preview to it, on how we are using HIV prevention cascades to track an individual who has been enrolled in an HIV program until we are able to, to, to see their final results. And also we have linked uh, with the clinical indicators from the Ministry of Health and Child Care to be able to compute and complete the clinical cascade. We are also utilizing the DHIS2 maps to uh, see whether our peers are distributed appropriately and also comparing with other documents like the hotspot mapping. In terms of the major challenges, I'll quickly go through these. Managing uh, 6,000 uh, devices is very complex. I'm sure we will all agree. We also uh, experience frequent loss of the tablets during to, due to theft and damages, but we have them uh, insured in place. We have erratic supply of data bundles, which results in delays in data synchronization. We have high volunteer turnover because our population, who are the young people, they are very mobile, so often they they are moving from one, from one place to another and interoperability with other health information systems. I think the previous speakers have already flagged this out as a challenge. What are the lessons that we've learned? There is need for planning, recording of devices, especially during deployment because we had a huge number of devices to install, to configure and to distribute. Also to be comprehensive in terms of our system configurations. But we've also learned on a positive note that DHIS2 offers expanded M&E utility for the national HIV program in Zimbabwe. Our next steps, uh, we wish 
to pilot the INDOT app, the MOB ER. I think for those who managed to attend the Monday session, his Zimbabwe is working on a MOB ER, which wishes to address the issues of interoperability and also um, easy platform. Using biometric technology in future of the UIC and also developing self-help digital manuals, we will be joining the chatbots and AI sessions to learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. I think it's uh, it's seven star, no? Yes. Please come over. Tell us more. Thank you. Test. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Evans Mananyambe. I'm from an organization called Access to Health uh, Zambia. Um, my present, uh, presentation is not going to be very technical, just in case there are those that get bored too much with uh, coding language. I'm not a coder, fortunately for you. So um, I'm presenting on, the, on enhancing community health outcomes through strategic use of uh, DHIS to data. We are basically the consumers of the data um, in the project that we are doing. So uh, basically, um, I come from Wandi in the southern, uh, western part of Zambia, a very impoverished district where we face a lot of uh, challenges um, considering uh, uh, access to health uh, um, uh, services. Um, our project uh, trains uh, local community health workers um, in community health management information systems. We also um, work with uh, neighborhood health committees. Um, um, the community uh, system improves data collection at healthcare interventions. We find um, uh, DHIS to be very useful in uh, identifying health challenges in specific communities. And um, when we find these challenges, we look for solutions uh, on how to tackle the health uh, uh, challenges. So basically, we, our project uses uh, DHIS to, to track uh, community health uh, and facility indicators of our interest. Our project primarily deals with uh, mother and child health from uh, ANC to uh, PNC levels. Um, the key indicators include uh, monitoring home deliveries, and these have been of particular interest to us because when we started sometime back in 2018, uh, we had um, quite high numbers of uh, home deliveries up a thousand births in our district. I think there were somewhere around 50 uh, per thousand births. So we, when we do track these, um, we look for, for specific uh, targeted uh, um, interventions. Um, for example, when we did investigate some home deliveries, we found out some of the challenges that the women that were delivering at home were facing were uh, transport challenges uh, to the health facilities. Um, our district is really, really impoverished. It has only one stretch of about 60 kilometers of tarred road, which has been graded now because it was very bad. Um, some of our pregnant women will have to cover distances of about 45 kilometers to reach a facility one way. So uh, 
they found it easier to deliver at home than go cover such long distances. So some of the interventions uh, that came out of, 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 of this data is uh, we procured uh, ox drawn uh, cuts for neighborhood health committees to help pregnant women to the health facilities for both ANEC and um, uh, facility delivery. We also noticed from the, uh, the assessments that we did with the home deliveries that uh, some women uh, were so impoverished that they were unable to actually prepare for, 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 for receiving a baby. So the project um, ended up uh, supplying baby mama packs. Uh, those include a small blanket, a wrapper, soap, baby lotion, and so on, so that uh, we could encourage the women to actually so these uh, baby mama packs were only uh, available to the uh, women that delivered in a health facility. And from that, uh, we also uh, found out that because due to the distances that uh, our pregnant women had have to cover the health facilities, we encouraged them to actually go early to the health facility to wait for delivery at least a month before their uh, due date. But then at the health facility where they go to, to wait in the maternity waiting homes, the, the structures were not conducive. Uh, so the project uh, call, uh, came in and uh, we built, we started building actually some um, permanent uh, maternity waiting homes. We also um, started building um, permanent primary health care units in the remote uh, 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 communities. These pri primary health care units are structures where the health facility can uh, go and conduct uh, outreaches where they provide a comprehensive uh, health uh, services package. They, they, will co they will conduct immunizations there, they will conduct antenatal care there, they will conduct uh, postnatal care um, on a monthly basis then they will go back to the facility. Then um, the other thing that we do um, is support the district health office uh, with uh, essential commodities and equipment for community health care workers who operate at uh, community level. So these are some of the, uh, the structures that uh, we, we build. Um, in the top, Corner there is a there is a structure which looks like um, a small house, but that's what used to be a maternity waiting homes home at one of our health facilities where we we built the permanent mothers shelters. So um, by using um, uh, this DHIS two data as consumers and to try to help and improve. Uh, community health indicators and also uh, health facility indicators. The results of our implementation uh, are that uh, we have seen a reduction of home deliveries uh, from more than, um, yeah, for, for more than half from 2018 to 2023. We have also uh, seen increased health facility deliveries from around 80% uh, when we started the project in 2018 to at least uh, to 99% as of uh, 2023. Uh, also, our um, because now our, most of our women are delivering at health facilities, even our uh, skilled deliveries have uh, improved to around uh, to 98% as of 2023. When we started the project, um, we actually uh, found a first ANC um, before 14 weeks was around 30%. But um, when we implemented these targeted interventions, we have managed to raise the ANC to somewhere to 57% as of 2023. And the other result is that um, using um, our community health workers, we were now we are now able to treat uh, childhood child 
childhood illnesses at community level. Um, more than it was the case before we started uh, following these community indicators um, somewhere in 2018. So 60% of our, our childhood illnesses, that is ICCM, uh, being treated at community level. So um, from the lessons learned side, uh, we've noticed that uh, learned that tackling community-based health system greatly improves health facility indicators, and also a well-coordinated, equipped, and supported community data system leads to better understanding of community problems, thereby informing programming and decision making. Then we have also, um, when we we did some trainings for the community HMYS, which is in DHIS2, for our neighborhood health commit, uh, co committees or zones, we actually noticed that they the, the community responded better to health intervention when they understand the importance of the data they generate. Challenges. Um, the, we use smartphones for us community health workers uh, to actually capture data at community level, which is uh, uh, quite expensive. And um, it's um, also someone was uh, mentioned uh, something to do with the provision of data to the community health workers, which has also been also erratic, uh, thereby affecting the the synchronization of community data. The, also, the cost associated with consistent support for data bundles is very high. And we, the other thing that we noticed is that uh, our colleagues from um, from our district health office have uh, very low interest in um, uh, community data. So it um, you really have to push for for our friends to actually appreciate that um, tackling community uh, uh, problems at community level actually helps to relieve the pressure at the health facility level. So, um, of course, we will continue advocating for our local authorities. One of the challenges that we, had, that we have actually currently in our district is our network uh, uh, coverage. It's, it's really very poor. So it uh, provides a very big challenge for our community health workers to, to, to synchronize data. Some have to walk distances of about an hour to just go and uh, synchronize their data. So us continue advocating to our local authorities so that they can at least expand uh, network coverage. And also we are working really hard to orient our district health uh, colleagues on the need for them to pay more attention to community health data and how it affects uh, facility data. So thank you. I think I'm done. Thank you so much, Evans. That was super fast. And no worries, I I, I'm really no course. coder either. No one was expecting anything. Um, last but far from least, Dr. Mania from, uh, from the Kenyan Ministry of Health and also seconded his, his Kenya. Um, yes, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, it's still in the morning, although at home is in the afternoon. So I would like to make a presentation on the development of integrated community health information system. I'm doing this on behalf of a team from Kenya. The person who was supposed to make was very excited when she got the visa, but the excitement died when the logistics became difficult to fly to this place. Luckily, I've been part of the team, so I'll be able to handle anything that comes up. I, I just give a small background 
about the community health strategy in the country, we are moving from being uh, educated to also being able to, I mean, able to utilize high facilities, but we also have communities that require support from the lower level. And so we have a very good community health strategy that allows people within the community to visit households and promote health care and do some referrals. Largely, these people have not been receiving any stipends, and they've been doing it on a voluntary basis. So we've been calling them community health volunteers. But with some changes, we've decided to give them some stipend, and also with a stipend, we have decided to change their name to community health promoters, because they are now promoting. And in the process, we have also come up with a, a tool to support them in Inform, in information gathering as they work. And that's where we developed the integrated community health information system. In the pro that comes with a, a, a kit, which has a lot of uh, equipment, maybe something to measure blood pressure. And of course, the, nowadays that we are so advanced, it is um, a smartphone. And so that brings in the excitement. So I'll just go through that, this presentation we have. And, and generally, this is actually in the old style of teaching. This could mean the end of this, the training. This slide is everything. We started by developing the community health strategy. And then we decided to make the community health prototype, the, the software. We pilot tested. And now, at, at this time, we are at the level of scaling up and that's when they they say the the rubber meets the road eh? so we have that level of trying to implement i just want to say for us to come this far of course we were supported by the structures the policy environment is there we have uh, the national level was the one which was actually leading this this production of the system and of course it has issues when you handle something from the national level. So they are the ones who, who decided to have a secretariat, the development, there's quite a lot when it comes to development. I, I don't think it's necessary to go through everything that we did, the requirements, the specifications, and it's, it, it, it took so long at the national level, sitting together with many teams to discuss, this is how it look like, and many, many, many meetings, and I attended most of them so that the people who are the community health experts are able to work with the system developers to come up with the system that works, and then occasionally would run to the lower level to test them. So I would just say there was an involvement of many stakeholders, including the real national level, followed by the sub-county, sub-national level, who are actually involved in giving us all the requirements. And finally, the other very great stakeholder, it is the, the people who have some more money, the developing partners, they provide us the port, and uh, they were very useful. So in general, we are saying we were utilizing very great stakeholders in development, which we all know about how to develop a software. I don't want to go through the nitty gritties of sitting together and coming up with everything, but all the aspects of the stakeholders were actually well represented. This, this one is just to, it's a little bit too small detail. We just wanted to take a snip of some of the things we used to do during the development. You know, you have to, to have your roadmap. And uh, this is just as during the development, you say, have, have you done this? Have, do you have a plan? Do you have this? And this is just, it's not supposed to be detailed for you, but you just need to know that uh, behind everything, we had a really nice roadmap that was working with everything being ticked in any time we are doing a project management. So this is just to show you some of the things we, we used to write behind the scenes. But when you talk to the politicians, we just tell them everything is working. But there are all those things we were Thinking, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you moved to the next version? So it's quite a lot of detail that I just wanted to show you this slide so that you, you know that 
when you see something moving, don't think it was just it there. There were those small, small things. We also worked through what we call a, a policy environment, and these are some of the policies we have in our country. We, we have a health policy, we have universal health coverage. The universal health coverage is actually encompassing that people have almost free treatment. It's not that free yet, but for us to be able to afford that, you also need the communities to be part of it. We have a Kenya Digital Health Act that actually came just the other day. It also allows some of these things. And, 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 and I think some of you have worked in this digital space. You know that the digital space is moving faster than the legislation space. So my, maybe after making this digital health act, you'll find that the AI has come up and it also requires legislation. So again, we'll be running to, to make more acts to capture. So we're always behind in one way or another. We also have a community health policy and uh, also we, we came up with a digitization strategy. All this is just to support so that we don't get ourselves into problems that we are working without proper legislation. I'll put this, this is a, a, a very good slide for most of us in our country as part of the environment that enables all this. We call it a digital superhighway. The government just came up that everything works should be within that superhighway. So you have communities coming up there and you have all these things coming to one area so that we have a digital superhighway with a digital ecosystem. I'm bringing all this just to show that there is an enabling environment from policies, from the way the government is looking at things so that whatever we do does not fall outside the, the environment. So these are some of the things we did to, that first of all, you create the environment and then you start developing the, the tools to fit in it. So this is um, a little bit detailed and it's a little bit specific to the country, but what it means is that it is within that environment that the integrated community health software falls and so that we are not left out in any other way. And uh, I think before I finish, I just want to tell you, so what have we done after developing all these things? What was interesting to the people? One, of course, the mobile phones, they were distributed. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're important because can you imagine somebody in the community carrying a very beautiful phone somewhere and, and then there's, there's the kit also, it has quite a lot of things. Of course, I don't want to bring the controversies of those kids like blood pressure machine. You may ask me what about that does a community health worker know the normal blood pressure of a human being or at what age and all this, but don't, those are small discussions later on. But they have, we've, been, we've given them and we, they are very happy about it. One, and then the next slide, I just want to, to show us the outputs. I would have wished to show it uh, physically, but I think we thought it's just to let you know, this is a dashboard. I just say after everything else, we created now a dashboard. There are rumors that the president looks at these dashboards. So, <laughs> so people really work very hard to say, well, like my, my county is the, the next second after Nairobi. So you see me, I've been telling my people, check, uh, the president will reward you if you do well. <laughs> so there are, and, and the reason I'm bringing up this is that one of the things that support the development of the community, of these digital tools is the support from the management. So the president is so keen on it and is, there are even rumors, there are not rumors, there was a clip on the social media where the president actually called a community health promoter and say, how are you doing? Yes. Do you have all the kids? And the, the, the health promoter was able to name all the contents in the kit. Imagine me, I can't even name. Maybe the, the, maybe the promoter was told in beforehand. <laughs> well, he named everything until you are getting surprised. This is a very sharp community health promoter. But the fact that the president can pick a phone and call the person, so it's already showing that the, the move is there. And so that support has been there. And... Uh, and so we have those showing all the, these dashboards now just because it's numbers, people are allowed to log in and see what is happening. And so I, I would say it's working well for now. And that will need to give a few challenges. 
of course, we have problems with the supportive supervision. We have a group of people called community health, uh, the people are a little bit of health background who are supposed to support to supervise these community promoters. Sometimes they don't do very well. And then we have minimum household visits. They also just visit. And there was also a joke. I don't know if it's a joke, but somebody said these people come from very rich gated homes. They have never seen a community health promoter. So maybe they also visit just the like which which district in Zambia they say the impoverished district. That's the only one which eh, is called what? Mandi. Maybe that's where these people like working. So there are those kind of things. So you find they are not visiting all the, the places. And uh, sometimes the data synchronization doesn't occur very well. And of course, number the last one, you all know it works, isn't it? The laws, eh? That, that's a normal story of losing, the raining, and they the get damaged. And there is this, uh, this white listing was that you, you, you don't need to pay for the, the money, I mean, for internet. Our, internet. our supplier was just to give it for you. And it does not work very well. So, some of these things with the, you are promised that you'll, you don't need internet because the company has already paid. Yeah, so that's some of the some of the challenges that we got. Oh, sorry. So, so what happened? Slide. Yeah. The last slide. I think we just we just on the last slide, and we we just talking some of the of the lessons learned. I had said it earlier on. The, yeah, it's correct. Yeah, that's correct. We we've we've said it before. Very strong support from the government leadership. We also all the partners were involved, uh, stakeholder involvement, and then continuous technical support. Uh, for troubleshooting, that is there. We also have the private partnership and private and public where the company like Safaricom, which is our largest company, is able to supply some of this equipment. And then we have the decentralization of uh, management. Initially, I told you it was heavily at national level, but now when we brought it down and people started accepting that. And then, of course, some of the lessons learned uh, it was that we also need to come to really link these community health promoters to the local health facilities in a proper way because sometimes when they refer people there they don't get first priority and so we need to, to convince the nurses that when you get a referral from the a promoter at least they should recognize and have that referral system working. So that's one of the areas that we still think will have a problem. Otherwise, uh, uh, thank you for listening. And uh, my colleagues, even if they're also online, they'll be able to, to help me answer some of the questions. But I was part of the team, so I'll also be able to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mania. Well, Another round of applause, I guess, like uh, all the presenters deserve it. Community health in general is not an easy task. And you see that independently on where they are, like there are very common struggles, especially when it comes to uh, management of uh, of mobile devices and, and resources as well. And unfortunately, community health in general tends to be overseen. And unfortunately, the, the investment in it and the way that data get into the information system is not really like a fueled as much as like facility data sometimes. Um, we have literally five minutes and I was wondering if someone had a question or two to our presenters. I cannot believe that everything is super clear. It's impossible. There's so much that is left unsaid. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the clear presentation. I have a, a 
question for the last uh, presenter. It's about uh, the involvement of the high authorities uh, in the country. That really very appreciate. But I want to know in terms of funding, if uh, the government also uh, in how level is the participation of the local government on the funding? Thank you. Thank you. We also have one here. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. I think the, the community is where we are lacking in terms of uh, health information system. So my question is, uh, we have a lot of uh, community of health cadres in different programs. It is disintegrated. Oh, just otherwise it's super. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. So the community health workers are everywhere. It's disintegrated. It is uh, supported by different programs. So have you managed to integrate? It may be for the community health worker to work all the programs to, to support. And also the in the system was the digital. Are you using the tracker program that all the community health workers are tracked uh, their work? This question is particularly to, to in general. To in, in general, maybe to Kenya, the first one. The first one. Yeah. Okay. So then. Anyone else? Or shall we get started? Okay. So first of all, Maya, where where are you sitting, Money? Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's the opposite. Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay, so so thank you for the questions. I, I, I would like to say that if you go by the community health strategy and say each health, each community promoter has to support maybe 10 households then the number of the community health promoters will be very many. And if you have to pay them a salary, we calculate it. Their salary would be more than the government budget for Ministry of Health. So what happened is that the government just, as I told you, the president is interested. He said he'll give a few of them, actually like 100,000 promoters from the government payment. So he's paying a few. Of course, you know what that causes. There'll be other things. Why are my paid and the other one is not paid? <laughs> so we have all those problems. But uh, yes, the government has taken a step to pay a few because they can't manage. And also, that means the other partners in the country, sometimes they also pledge, I'll pay a few in this particular uh, is it? What is it called? In this particular and the other one pick, and I guess occasionally people pick regions based on their interest or based on poverty rates and based I don't know what else, but some of these NGO non-government organizations have their priorities and how to choose. So you have a country that is not uniform. Others are paid, others are overpaid, and what is the others just watch. So to implement a proper community health strategy with incentives. I think we are waiting to see any country that has done well. I think I hear that Ethiopia has, but in Kenya, we are still struggling. Thank you. Thank you, Mania. And there was a question also for Vincent. Yeah, oh, okay. So thank you very much. Okay, continue as if nothing no is happening. Ah, okay. We're almost running out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I about the system being aggregate or tracker, I will say it was hybrid because Okay, that's okay. We are going to switch. Test, test. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, try this. It must be the answer is very strong. It's, it's scaring the system. 
So uh, about the system we use at the community, I would say it was hybrid because we start by identifying where the hotspots are. And that one we reported using aggregate numbers. So where you get the people, you say this is an area where we're going to screen people. So screening data was reported in aggregate, but the moment we get presumptives, the presumptives now, and we refer, refer them to the lab. Now in the laboratory is where we start capturing the tracker. So any positives that go to the laboratory are entered in the tracker system. And then the whole continuum of care continues with the tracker, which we call the electronic case-based surveillance system for TB. So it monitors from uh, positives to starting treatment until treatment success or treatment outcomes, even contact tracing and TB prevention. Well, once again, thank you very much for coming today. You've seen the presenters, so feel free to to grab them in the corridors during the during the day. And uh, there is a question online. It's more like the fact that we are running out of time. What what question is that? Two. So the question on Zoom is: Does the ECHIS work along with a village register, or is there a complete change to digital systems for Kenya. Did you hear it, Manya? Yeah, I, 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 I think the, the answer is yes and no. We are developing a, a register for all patients and everybody. We have already done HIV registry is very well done. We're moving on to the other. So it, it is actually meant to work generally. That's why we have a, a digital superhighway that will fit in all these things in time. But meanwhile, it is not yet complete. But it does. The answer is yes, it, it should be able to work with all the registries when, when you're done. Thank you. Once again, thank you, everyone, for coming today. We did write to community health, especially competing with AI session. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And uh, let's continue the conversation also throughout the day. Cheers. <laughs>